Okay, uh, welcome everybody to uh, our, our this week's SPCLB cast. Uh, this time I'm actually calling in from the beautiful Salishan Lodge and closer to Vikram than usual, so he's in Illinois. Um, I'm super happy that he agreed to give a, a talk and, and Vikram and I go back a, a long time, so it's, it's great to get an update on his work and I'll let uh, Martin now introduce Vikram formally. Thank you, thank you. Vikram is the Donald B. Gillies Professor of Computer Science and Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, Vikram and his PhD student Chris Lapner co-designed the LLVM compiler. Uh, Vikram is a fellow of the ACM and was named the University Scholar at the University of Illinois in 2015. Vikram's research interests lie in developing and using compiler techniques to improve the performance, programmability, and energy efficiency of computer systems. Vikram will give us a presentation on HPVM. If you have any questions throughout the talk, please feel encouraged to put them on the chat uh, or wait with your questions. We're gonna have a Q&A session afterwards and also a couple of uh, short Q&A breaks in the presentation. Thanks Vikram for being with us. And without further ado, the stage is all yours. Thank you very much for, for the introduction, Marcin and, and Torsten. Thank you for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, it's been a long time since uh, I think I've given a talk to your group or, or as you said, uh, since we've been uh, in uh, done any work together really. So uh, I'm especially excited to do this. I actually was spent a year at EPFL when uh, that was, I think maybe the last time that I came to EDH and visited, visited you all, but it's been a, it's been a while. Uh, that was 2014, 2015, actually. Um, so let me make sure I my screen sharing works. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, I hope you all can see the screen. I've not gone blank. Okay. So um, I'm going to be talking about a project on compiling and programming heterogeneous parallel systems. And I know that there's been quite a lot of work on heterogeneous systems and parallel computing, of course, at ETH. And many of you, I'm sure, are quite um, knowledgeable about the area. But I also believe it's a pretty broad audience. So I'm going to start at a fairly high level. Um, the work itself has been uh, going on over several years. And some of the students who have um, been the main lead uh, contributors to the work are the first few names on this list here, Hashem and Yifan uh, for the approximate computing part of the work, Adil for the HPG, HP, sorry, FPGA part of the work, Akash and Rafai for the hydride and retargetability part, and Maria has been the main um, lead on the original HPVM work, which is um, what I will start with, but I won't spend too much time on it because that's sort of the it's a building block for uh, the rest of the research. And Sarita Ardve, Girish Chaudhary, and Sasha Nisailovich are three faculty members who've collaborated with us on the work here. So just as a quick outline, I'm going to start by motivating why edge computing applications has been a main area of focus for our work in uh, with heterogeneous systems. Heterogeneous systems, of course, come up a lot in the HPC and other uh, cloud computing areas as well, but our focus has been more on the edge and I'll say why. And then give a brief introduction to HPVM itself. Um, I always pack way too much information into my talk. So if I go at a superficial level through some things, I apologize. And uh, in fact, the second, the third piece, which is on a particular direction within, uh, on top of HPVM more recently on compiling for uh, programming FPGAs from hardware agnostic software programs. Um, I'll also keep that brief, um, but uh, I thought some of you are, have worked in that area and will be interested in that. And then I'll spend roughly the last half of the talk on how we enable really retargetable compilation for uh, uh, diverse kinds of systems. So let me start with the motivation. Um, I don't need to tell you all, I'm sure, that there are many applications that are becoming increasingly important today that run at the edge of the network using relatively small resource-constrained devices, um, but yet must deliver very high quality results under severe resource constraints. Um, so mobile phones and mobile robots, AR, VR headsets, drones, autonomous vehicles, smart devices and so on, right? And really to enable 
these systems at all to get the functionality and the energy efficiency they need, they almost universally re rely on specialized um, hardware, on, on accelerators of various kinds, uh, programmable ones like GPUs, um, and sometimes FPGAs, but also a lot of other specialized um, domain-specific accelerators. And the biggest challenge with this area, well, one of the biggest challenges in this area is that programming these systems can be extremely challenging. Um, so for example, for a mobile phone, the, the SOC on a mobile phone can include devices with a number of different instruction sets, different parallelism models, and really incompatible memory systems and writing an application in, at any high level to be able to take advantage of this is, is really challenging. And the way people do it today is to write different components for each of these devices, often in different languages. A similar situation came up in a recent project where we were designing an SOC for an autonomous vehicle, which had a whole number of different customized accelerators and a general CPU. Um, I won't go through the details of the design, but the, the point is still the same. And so that's one broad challenge that, that edge hardware often uses, uh, edge, edge applications require specialized hardware for energy efficiency and performance. A second broad challenge is that to program these systems, compilers need to evolve rapidly. And this is, for example, um, very, uh, it's been most clear recently in vector um, instruction sets and also neural network accelerators where um, processors have been evolving really fast and the traditional approach to compilation has, has not been good enough. And so languages like Halide have had custom backends for every uh, vector instruction set. And I'll actually say more about this later in the talk. But this kind of approach is just not scalable for every language to have separate backends for every hardware architecture. Um, so these are some of the challenges that we have been trying to address. There's another one, which I'm not going to go into in this talk, which is on trading off accuracy and, and precision in order to get better energy efficiency through approximate computing. Um, it's actually been a broad area of work in the group, but I decided to drop it just because of lack of time, but I will be happy to talk more about it if people are interested. So let me now talk about the HPVM system itself. HPVM is a compiler infrastructure that has been built on top of the LLVM system. LLVM um, has limited support for parallelism um, because it's not meant to be a parallel IR. HPVM adds a parallel abstraction on top of LLVM and that abstraction serves as a compiler IR. It can also serve as a virtual ISA, meaning that you can ship programs in HPVM form just like you can ship them in LLVM form. Incidentally, Apple, all Virtually all mobile apps for Apple devices are shipped in LLVM form to Apple and then compiled to individual end user targets. And so this form of shipping code, um, which is very successful in the Java and, and CIL world is also now starting to be used in the static uh, languages world like um, C++ and Swift. Um, and then HP, the compiler IR is also the basis for retargetable code generation. So a very high level overview of the HPVM system. Um, we have a common compiler IR, which is the box shown in orange here, which takes in for code from a number of different front ends like PyTorch and Keras for machine learning components or from a variant of C++, which we call hetero C++. This is, think about this as a sort of small subset of OpenMP for parallel uh, C++ applications. We didn't have the resources to build a full OpenMP front end. If we did, we would love to do that. Hetero C++ is sort of our experimental approximation for parallel code. And uh, we can support other front ends as well uh, in this manner, but these are the ones we have so far. And the IR is then uh, put through a number of graph transformations and a design space exploration engine, which I will say a little bit more about. We've used that extensively for the FPGA programming work. We also have an approximation tuning uh, layer, which, which introduces uh, energy accuracy aware optimizations that can actually affect application quality or accuracy and trade or, trades that off for better performance and energy efficiency. 
and then a bottom-up code generator framework, which uh, uses per target uh, code generators in the backends to compile each part of the application to a backend. And I'll say more about that. And finally, a runtime system to manage. Um, in fact, at, at runtime, we can trade off accuracy or performance for them. And we have backends for a wide range of different kinds of devices, including CPUs with vector instruction sets. And we're building one with the matrix uh, instruction set EMX as well. GPUs, FPGAs, fixed function accelerators, like mainly FFT and VTRB, and also programmable accelerators in the machine learning space. And the HPVM IR, as I said earlier in this context, is used as a retargetable compiler IR and system for building compilers. It can be used for portable object code for shipping programs, and it can also be used for runtime scheduling, which is a capability we recently added in uh, for autonomous vehicles. So there's a lot of information about it in the papers and in the software release. I just noticed that the most recent release, HPVM 2.0 from last year is missing on this slide. So the slide is out of date. I actually have a whole another slide about the release coming up later. So that's a very, very sort of 20,000 foot overview of the HPVM system. But let me say a little bit more about the IR itself first and then how we've used it. So the apps, IR is, based on an abstraction of parallel computation, which is essentially a data flow graph, with, but with side effects, so it's not pure data flow. A single node in the graph represents computations that in fact, we just use straight up LLVM code for the nodes. So that can be a mixture of scalar and vector computations and you have standard load and store instructions, so that's how the side effects appear. So you can have shared data between multiple nodes that way. But the graph is also hierarchical, which means that a single node may contain an entire data flow graph of its own. And you can have multiple layers of it. And that's important because many devices within a heterogeneous system internally has its own parallelism. So you could imagine that a, a single GPU has extensive parallelism inside it, but it may be part of a larger system with multiple other devices. So it might have another, multiple GPUs or you might have another FPGA, which has its own parallelism or a custom accelerator with its own parallelism. And this abstracts that very nicely. Um, one feature of the data flow graph, which is important is that a single node really actually represents a number of dynamic instances. We don't create the dynamic instances at runtime. So this is a conceptual idea. It's a conceptual view of the parallelism, but essentially you can think of a, a node as having a parameter N, which represents N uh, way parallelism. And it is a requirement that the programs that are compiled into the HPVM IR um, are parallel, meaning that each in the instances of a single node must be independent and have no uh, cross, no cross instance dependencies. And that gives us, um, Parallelism. So, for example, loop level parallelism is very nicely captured in this way as a single node in the graph. And so, more broadly, the graph nodes here capture both coarse grain or fine grain computational tasks, depending on what uh, granularity you choose for each node in the graph. And the front end or the, uh, the front end really gets to choose that. The graph edges represent explicit data transfer between the nodes. So, this is a logical data movement like in a classical data flow graph, but the loads and stores within each node represent implicit data movement or implicit communication through shared memory across the nodes. And the hierarchical graph represents multiple levels of nested parallelism. And because of the graph structure, you get task parallelism across nodes because any two nodes that have no dependence between them can be run independently and they can be completely different computations. But the instance of a single node can represent fine grain or coarse grain data parallelism um, for a single node. And you can also get pipeline streaming parallelism through the edges in the graph. And so this one single abstraction represents, we think, all the forms of parallelism that, are, uh, that occur in heterogeneous systems today. And we can map individual nodes to, to multiple different targets in a, in a backend system. And so I have a, an example of the data flow graph for a, uh, for a pipeline image processing example for edge detection and black and or grayscale images show where we have pipeline task parallelism with streaming between the stages 
medium grain data parallelism within individual stage, within a major pipeline stage and fine grain data parallelism in every stage. And the nodes within the, uh, within the, the larger orange nodes represent hierarchical uh, parallelism as well. I won't go through all the details, but this is an example of how a, a pipeline parallel program can be represented very naturally in HPD. One of the important goals for programmability for heterogeneous systems, we believe, is to enable hardware agnostic programming. So this is a term that is not formally defined in any particular sense. It's not, but it's not something we've seen much in the literature. We use it a lot in our own work. Our main point and the definition, the informal definition we give for it is that the entire programming process, including the software itself and the whole tuning and, and debugging and so on should, should be done in a way that's not specific to a particular device or class of devices. Meaning the programmers writing application level source code should not have to be aware of the technical details of the underlying hardware. And instead the programming environment, the tools of the programming environment should automatically compile and optimize code for each target device. And so for example, today people write code in CUDA for FPGA, I'm sorry, for GPUs, or they might write code in HLSC or even Verilog for FPGAs. They might write code in some lower level other framework for um, machine learning or image processing. Um, those kinds of hardware specific notations are really not hardware agnostic at all. And they make programming far more challenging in the context of heterogeneous systems. And that is what we want to avoid. And this definition implies a set of constraints on the languages that we want, that we support and the programming, uh, the programming process using those languages and a set of requirements on the underlying programming tools. I just go through the constraints quickly. They automatically imply some natural constraints on the tools, but so first, for example, there should be no hardware specific tuning of particular parameters at the application level. Um, uh, so for example, tuning uh, memory sizes or tuning tiling, tiling uh, levels and so on should not have to be done for each particular hardware target by the application programmer. Should be done automatically. Most importantly, we don't want manual code restructuring every time you want to retarget your application for a new system um, or, or a new device. And that's especially onerous for application codes. But it's also particularly difficult, and it's partly what makes this a research goal, to be able to enable good performance without requiring deep code restructuring. No explicit platform-specific coding. So for example, partitioning code between a host processor and the accelerators, which is done even in OpenMP today. This is a common strategy where you use target um, uh, the target construct to specify what parts of the code should be offloaded onto accelerators is something that requires thinking about the underlying hardware structure. And it's really something that we think sh should be automated by the system. And in fact, is automated by HPVM. Um, th it should be, there should be no limitation to specific domains. That doesn't mean domain specific programming and languages are not important. And in fact, we think that programmability requires using appropriate languages for different components. So it might very well be that some components use a particular DSL, like a, like PyTorch for a machine learning component or Halite for an image processing component, or even Spiral or some other comp DSL for particular components. But an application may combine multiple such components and the underlying programming infrastructure should allow them to interoperate. And we actually think that HPVM already gives you that capability. So we can allow components from, for example, Hetero C++ and PyTorch to coexist in the same application and run as part of the same code base on the same system. And HPVM will compile them together. No hardware specific optimization tuning by the programmer. I think I've already said this, but um, that should be, uh, it should naturally follow from some of the many of the other things. And no explicit offloading decision. So this is one particular feature today of FPGA programming and other heterogeneous systems that application programmers manually partition their programs between multiple devices. They manually choose what runs on which accelerator, which device. 
Um, if you have an FPGA-based system, they manually choose what runs on the FPGA, what runs on the host. With GPUs, they choose what runs on the GPU, what runs on the host. These kinds of decisions really do not seem necessary, but can be automated well. So um, one more important feature in HPVM, which greatly improves flexibility is that you can take a data flow graph of the HPVM program and map any node of the graph to any of the target devices on the system in principle. Um, and so with n graph nodes and k devices, you get k to the power of n different possible static mappings of a particular application to a particular heterogeneous system with k devices. Now, I'm not claiming that any mapping will work well. Obviously, that some nodes will work much better on some devices than on others. It does depend on the algorithms and the nature of the, on, of the data communication, data, uh, the internal parallelism. Um, and so the best mappings are something that should and can be selected by the system at compile time. Um, moreover, in principle, you could also modify these mappings at runtime. We've only done some very limited experiments on dynamic remapping of a given node to different devices as the program is executing. Um, it's a capability that is enabled by HPVM um, and uh, can be taken advantage of by a runtime scheduler extensively. So I just very briefly go through some of the go evaluation goals and methodology. And I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but these are some of the early experiments we did with HPVM on a multi-core system with an Intel Xeon with AVX instru uh, vector instructions and an NVIDIA GTX 80 GPU with two gigabytes of memory. And the main comparison we wanted to make is to compare against separately hand-tuned codes so in other words, codes that were hand-tuned for the GPU, but also separately hand-tuned for the vector instruction sets. And some of the codes were common, but, but some of the codes were distinct as well. And uh, in other words, you needed different versions to get the best performance when you did hand-tuning. And what we found, and I'm just gonna present sort of one snapshot of the results quickly, but for example, on the GPU, where the baseline for 1.0 is the, uh, hand-tuned performance, the performance of the hand-tuned code on the GPU for each of these benchmarks, uh, which is the right-hand sidebar. Um, the left-hand sidebar shows the performance of the HPVM generated code. And what you can see is that in all but two cases, HPVM matches or beats the hand-tuned code. In the two cases where it's slower, it's within about 20% of the hand-tuned code. And most, the, most, the worst one, for example, here is BFS where there is an extra data copy. No, it's actually not an extra data copy. There's some extra computation, the blue part of the bar that's higher on the HPVM side. And it turned out that um, there's something in the NVIDIA code generator for the PTX code. So we actually generate identical PTX code and it's not clear why we are getting slower performance in the final uh, execution time in this case. So. There's something, I think, somewhat mysterious going on there with, with BFS. And in the, in the case of the Intel AVX vector instruction sets as well, uh, again, we match in all but two cases. In one case, we're within 20%, except in LBM. In LBM, there was a, uh, there was a, okay, I apologize. Now it's been several years, so I don't remember what the problem with LBM was. Um, and I have to take this offline, but I can I can answer that question. If someone has a question of why LBM was so much slower, but it was significantly slower than the hand tuned um, in this case. The, the overall point here though, is that you can write programs in hardware agnostic form and get performance competitive with hand tuned code for individual devices um, in most cases for your applications. So I'm going to move on to the FPGA work just in the interest of time. I'll only spend a few minutes on this, but if you're interested, I can certainly talk more about this offline. Um, so this FPGA, in the FPGA world, I think this hardware specific programming is especially egregious. And if you look at kind of the, the entire space of these, you can on the left end here, 
you have very hardware specific programming models like Verilog and RTL, which are the traditional hardware description languages, which is how FPGAs have been programmed for the longest time. And they still very much are. In fact, I know lots of people in research groups that use RTL. They literally use Verilog for their research and it requires deep hardware knowledge and a long design process to make that possible. There's increasing use of HLS tools like HLSC and, and OpenCL or, or, other, or, hetero, or HetroCL and others, where you have higher level abstractions and that really greatly simplifies the programming level, but the tuning of the programs is still extensively done on a device specific way for this, uh, even these class of tools. And it re really does require quite extensive hardware understanding. And at the end of the day, you get you completely lose portability because of the extent of the tuning for particular hardware. And increasingly, FPGAs are being used by application programmers, like for example, in the cloud in both AWS and in Microsoft Bing, you have FPGAs available and there are lots of uh, software uh, or teams who are starting to use them. We think that HLS tools really don't give you the ability for these application programmers to use them. The other end of the spectrum, we have some domain specific languages. So Halide is a good example of this, where research groups have started to compile domain specific languages like Halide to FPGAs, which are certainly hardware agnostic because the language doesn't have any notion of the underlying FPGA. And you can get good performance, but it's very much limited to a narrow domain. And there's very few such examples really uh, in the literature. So our goal is to be able to get this hardware agnostic programming, but for a much wider range of application groups. And so today's state of the art is really, we think not feasible for application developers. And so in a project called HPVM to FPGA, which was led by Adil Eje, uh, we have been building on the HPVM system using design space exploration in order to get good performance for FPGAs. Um, I'll give you a high level overview of the system Again, I can talk much more about it offline, but um, we've done a slightly modified front end, which takes the hetero C++ programs with no hardware specific annotations. There are some annotations to say what loops are parallel, but that's in, uh, already part of hetero C++, but we also say what, for example, the size of an array might be if you have an array parameter to a particular code, uh, a particular function, uh, and that helps us dealing with, for example, buffer size and so on. It is not a tuning parameter. So that's really important here. It's completely hardware agnostic. It's a property of the program, but not a property of the underlying hardware. Um, but that greatly reduces how much static analysis you need in order to get good performance. And at run, uh, sorry, at compile time then with the design space exploration approach, we can use performance estimates for with a partial compilation, put it through a tool called Hypermapper, which was developed by Luigi Nardi's group um, and um, is a separate design space exploration tool based on Bayesian optimization, which we've incorporated into HPVM to FPGA. And then we use a number of compiler optimizations with configurable parameter values, which can be tuned by Hypermapper. And that allows us to, uh, to optimize programs for a given FPGA automatically without hardware specific parameters. And then we put that optimized code through, an, through a backend to generate the bit stream for the FPGA and a CPU binary. And moreover, um, so this is a modular and extensible framework in the sense that you can add different compiler optimizations, you can use different kinds of performance estimates and different backends. The one feature from the backend that we do use is shown here. So I'm expanding that backend box a little bit we are building, we are working with Altera FPGAs, which has an OpenCL to Altera flow, a tool chain called AOC. And AOC generates the bitstream uh, for the kernel modules. But AOC also has a feature that it can do a partial compilation to RTL and generate a pre synthesis report that provides some parameters that we can feed back to get a performance estimate to drive the performance tuning step. And that's how we do the performance tuning here. And uh, there are a number of optimizations we've implemented so far, which are specific to the FPGA flow in HPVM, uh, like automatic input buffering, argument privatization, loop unrolling, 
uh, loop fusion or uh, node fusion, which is a higher level of fusion, and then task parallelism and, and automatic IV depth insertion basically to try and identify uh, loops that can be mapped to pipelined parallel kernel structures. And the table here shows some of the DSE parameters that can be manipulated by the design space exploration tool and the granularity where those parameters apply. I won't go through the details of the optimizations, except to say that this is one preliminary set that we've added. It's easy to add more, but the DSE tool needs to know whether a parameter is a Boolean or an integer, um, and, uh, um, and then it can automatically manipulate and choose the values of these uh, parameters to fine tune the optimizations. And the performance modeling itself uh, takes into uh, account two sets of parameters. One set of parameters comes from profiling where we take into, uh, we use loop trip counts that come from profiling the application. The second set of parameters come from the pre-synthesis report from AOC. And this includes the initiation intervals, which are the cycle counts, and then the latencies of loop bodies and the uh, an estimate of the frequency of the final hardware design. And we use that to uh, through a, uh, with, with an analytical model to estimate execution time for the generated FPGA code. It's not super accurate, but we found that it is reasonably uh, good for getting uh, for getting good performance choices in most cases. There have been a couple of cases where this estimate has not been uh, as reliable as we would like, and so there are there is room for improvement on this. And again, I'll take you through a quick performance uh, experimental evaluation, and then I want to stop and ask for uh, any questions people might have before I go to the last part. So there are four questions we wanted to evaluate in the experiments. One is, what is the overall benefit of the optimizations that I mentioned in the previous slide, on the earlier slide? Um, also, which optimizations contribute the most to the performance gains overall, to the overall gains? Uh, how does how well does the DSE framework work? In other words, um, does it add value in terms of getting good performance over and above just picking a fixed sequence of optimizations? And then again, comparing to hand-tuned FPGA designs, which we can do only for a few cases because we only have hand-tuned code for a few cases, but we're able to do that in a few cases. And the benchmarks we used are three um, somewhat realistic application codes, a camera, image processing pipeline, the edge detection pipeline I mentioned earlier, an audio encoder from a virtual reality application framework called Elixir that's being developed here at Illinois. Um, and then a couple of standard benchmark suites, the Rodinia benchmarks and the Mark suite benchmarks. And all except Mark suite here are multi-kernel benchmarks. So they actually lead to multiple FPGA kernels in an FPGA design. And that's important because configuring the, the individual kernels and doing the, and, and optimizing the data transfers becomes important to get good performance. So I'm only going to summarize the performance results because there are a lot of them. Um, but I think this is, uh, I think uh, it, it, it's all I have time for. I'd be happy to give you more details anytime you like. And the paper at the bottom here has all of the uh, all of the graphs. So. First and most sort of at a very high level, these the, the optimizations that we use achieve an overall 4x speed up on average, the geometric mean across the benchmarks that I mentioned on the previous slide, and, and as much as 68x, and that's compared with the purely sequential execution. And so we think that the automated FPGA programming tool chain has been quite effective in getting uh, good results on the FPGA. Um, out of the optimizations, the argument privatization and the uh, loop unrolling and loop fusion provide the biggest speed ups when those are applicable. Um, and uh, NF increases opportunities for the optimization. So it's really more of an enabling transformation for some of the other optimizations. Those are some details and the, there's more details in the paper if you're interested. The design space exploration framework automatically provides very significant speed ups. And in particular, 
as up to 33x speed ups on some of the multi kernel benchmarks. And this, uh, so I have not presented the most recent part of this work, but we have been extending this design space exploration framework to automatically partition uh, an application that doesn't fit on the FPGA between the CPU and the FPGA. And it can easily be extended to multiple FPGAs as well. And the DSE framework is easy to extend to that. Um, the results I'm presenting here uh, map the entire app, uh, application code to the FPGA already, all the FPGA kernels to the FPGA. But in the, in the ongoing work, we're also using this for partitioning. And what we found is that compared with the hand-tuned performance uh, in the cases where we have that available, which is mainly in um, mock suite, what we found is that we meet hand-coded performance in all but two or three, two cases. Um, but in a couple of cases, we are significantly behind and we still need, um, we would need to add more optimizations in order to get performance that matches hand-tuned in those cases. But it's important to understand that hand-tuned, the, the, the difference in effort between hand-tuned versus what we are doing is enormous. And so to be able to match hand-tuned performance in many cases is a significant accomplishment. We think that we can get even better in some of the missing cases. And so this is something where I think the maturity of the framework is going to be key to be able to get even closer to hand-tuned in more cases as well. So we have released HPVM open source several times now. The most recent release last year um, includes the whole, it basically includes everything that I've talked about so far, as well as some things I've not talked about with, in particular, the approx tuner, uh, approximate tuning framework, which does both static and dynamic tuning of approximations um, and supports the uh, machine learning components as well. We have backends for Intel, uh, for the x86 and RISC-V instruction sets, for NVIDIA via OpenCL, for the Altera FPGAs via the OpenCL and AOC tool flow, and then a whole bunch of documentation and testing and, and application codes that come with it. And the release is at the link at the top of the slide. We're actually working on a new release right now, which should happen uh, next month, and that will probably be on GitHub. Um, and the main extensions there are that the HPVM, the, the FPGA work, has much more extensive design space exploration work and, um, and also support for partitioning. And the HetroC++ front end has better, uh, just better, more complete features, a more complete feature set. So that's HPVM and HPVM to FPGA. Um, let me stop here and ask if anyone has any questions on the work I've presented so far, because I've been talking about a lot of things. Um, and I'm the only one saying anything. So, are there any questions from anyone at today? Yeah, please go ahead, Alexander. Hello. Uh, thank you. This is very interesting. Um, so, here at SPCL, one of the tools that we are developing is called DACE, and it's quite similar in many of the respects of trying to do this kind of cross-platform code generation and optimization, but through a also through a data-centric um, angle. And one thing that I, I, I would like to know, th this is very important, getting to this expressing the code in a, expressing the parallelism in a program in such a way that it can then be specialized for different architecture, I think yeah. is a very important goal. Um, one thing that we've observed though is that there is sometimes significant effort in taking existing codes and then creating this agnostic representation in the first place. And yes. one thing I'm wondering in the in your uh, front end in this hetero C++, could you give me a bit of an intuition what the effort is involved in rewriting an application to this front end? Right. So. Um, if you start with an application that is parallel, so in other words, it already has parallel loops or parallel tasks um, or the appropriate data flow 
that you want like streaming parallelism or whatever, right? In the in a sequential C++ program, but the algorithm underlying it is parallel. Hetero C++ itself is really relatively minimal. Let me actually pull up some example slides at the very end and I'll show you what is involved. So hetero C++, so here's an example code. We have two loop nests and a, and a main function that calls a function foo and to mark it as a parallel loop, all you have to do is to add this one um, special function call, which we call hetero parallel loop. Think of this as an open MP parallel directive, but we use a function call just because we want to minimize changes to the C++ front end. This parallel function calls get, uh, move, get copied down into the LLVM IR without any changes. And so it's just a way to add the, the annotations. And the parallel loop function call here uh, just says how many enclosing loop levels are parallel because you can have multiple loop levels. And it also says, this is the one feature that's not an open MP. What are the input variables and the output variables? So here there are two input variables, M1 and M1 size. Sorry, M1, which is an array of, si of uh, size M1 size. So M1 is a pointer of, to an array of that size. And then a second input, which is dimension, and that does not have a size parameter. I see. And there's one output, which also is M1. And so that's the annotation that says what this data flow, uh, this parallel application, um, that this is a parallel application with this particular um, parallel loop with the input and output data flow property. Um, and if you also have a task that's parallel uh, internally, then you can mark that as a task simply by enclosing it in a hetero task begin and a hetero task end pair of function calls. And the hetero task begin takes similar input. So it shows the incoming and outgoing arguments, which effectively become the data flow edges in the underlying representation. And so there's notice that there's no restructuring to the computation itself. These annotations, just like if you had a parallel program, a sequential program, and you were parallelizing with OpenMP, um, in many cases, you can just add the annotations without restructuring the actual computations. And so that's really the goal with hetero C++. And the, we do add, we allow the programmer to add hints to say, if you want to target a particular task or node to a particular device, then you can provide a hint to do that to HPVM. Otherwise, HPVM will pick a default target. And we also do have a launch mechanism which launches an entire data flow graph. And so that graph, um, because we have a distinction between host code and the data flow graph, and the data flow graph is where all the parallelism is, and that can be mapped to the application. So that's really the extent of the hetero C++ annotations. I see. Uh, one challenge, uh, if, if I may just have one small comment here, and uh, yeah, yeah. one big challenge that I faced in trying to do this kind of helping existing applications get better performance by uh, getting them into a data-centric representation is that often, unfortunately, developers, when they write the original code for CPUs or for whatever architecture they do, they implicitly add a lot of hardware-specific optimization. For example, I don't know, for CPU, no, they, they already do some kind of manual optimization that has to kind of be rolled back. Yes, yes, that's absolutely true. And we face the same thing. And I don't, we don't have a magic bullet for that. I think the problem there is that programmers have been developing for, for tools that do not have all the nice features that we want them to have. And so effectively what you're doing is undoing sort of you know, 20, 30 years of bad habits on the part of the programmer, which they have been forced into because of limited programming tools. And there's, we don't have a solution to that. So we face this all the time. And in fact, taking an application and porting it, a significant part of the work is, is, is basically getting the underlying good sequential program first without those hardware specific annotations. That thank you. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I was actually wondering about the, 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 the target to FPGAs. Um, yeah. So, okay. which which forms, yeah. which applications do you do you target at where you 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 show that it makes sense to use FPGAs from a price performance uh, ratio? I mean, so uh, so that 
somebody would actually really use FPGAs. That's my first question. And the second one that you could probably answer in that context is, are you also targeting hardware designs, like generating RTL code to actually print domain-specific accelerators or something like that? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so, so both are good questions. Uh, on the first one, honestly, I've actually been somewhat disappointed or surprised on the negative side. I had much higher hopes for FPGAs. I have been somewhat disillusioned in the last three or so years I've been working on this HPVM to FPGA work. Um, I think what we found is that with the between GPUs and and other custom accelerators, FPGAs really seem to have been squeezed out of in terms of area cost and performance trade-offs. FPGAs have a narrower and narrower market and the place, so I'll give you one example at the application. So, you know, for hardware prototyping, there's always been a market and there still will be, right? Um, for network protocol interface, network interfaces, there's a market because you have fast moving in protocols and, and it's it's hard to um, get ASICs for those markets, but GPUs and so on are not good enough. But um, in the more application level area, so for example, in high frequency trading for financial uh, companies, that's an area where I've seen some adoption of FPGAs because they are experimenting with, with trading algorithms extensively and they, they want to get higher performance than what they can get with uh, multi-core processors. They're not appropriate for GPUs. And so they want hardware specialization, but the chain, but they're experimenting a lot with the algorithms. And so FPGAs are the only way they can do it because they cannot build ASICs for this. And I don't know to what extent they, I don't think they deploy them in actual trading because the latencies are too high. FPGAs are across a memory bus. I mean, uh, yeah, across an IO bus today and the latency for, for high frequency trading is just, that's not acceptable. They want kind of microsecond latencies for uh, making decisions. and But for de developing and training their algorithms, they seem to use them. That's been my experience in that area. So it's an example of where they have a niche, but that's such a narrow niche. It's not clear for this domain, how much it'll get used. And I'm sorry, I forgot your second question. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. I was just wondering about whether you also looked at uh, oh, generating RTA. domain specific accelerators. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So we've not done that much, but we've been part of two projects where we would like to do that. Uh, one is this project on autonomous vehicles where they've been prototyping an ASIC using FPGAs. And in principle, we could actually have saved them a lot of time and trouble in doing that um, because they could have gone through HPVM to FPGA and they, they already had a C++ application, which we've already been porting to HPVM. So the feasibility was very much there. And we're now part of a new project. It's a pretty long-term project on in-memory computing with a lot of accelerator design happening. And we hope that there will be some RTL uh, work happening there for, for custom accelerators. And that we use our, our FPGA tool for that. Thank you. Sure, my pleasure. So I am pretty short of time at this point. Let me jump back. Um, great, I came to a point where I was. So these were slides that I was not planning to present. They were actually, sorry. I'm trying to jump past slides. It was supposed to be hidden slides. Yeah, this is where I was. Um, I am pretty close to being out of time. So let me just very briefly mention the hydride work and then I will stop and take questions in the last couple of minutes here if people have questions about hydride or anything else. So the main goal of this work is to automatically retarget compilers for fast evolving architectures. And this work was led by two students, Akash Kothari and Abdullah Fainur and another couple of faculty. So, so Charit Mendes is a faculty member here. And Sudipta Sen Gupta is actually a senior research scientist and, and vice president at Amazon Research, um, who was also involved in the work. And the main motivation for the work is that unlike traditional compilers, today, if you take a high performance compiler like Halide or TVM, they, even though they use LLVM in their backends, they don't rely on the LLVM vectorizing code generator to target different vector instruction sets because you don't get good enough performance. Halide literally builds in uh, customized code generators for each of their hardware targets to get better performance than what LLVM will give you. 
And this just goes counter to like whatever, 50 years of work in compiler research, right? The, the model on the left is what virtually all compiler systems um, have been using is a retargetable intermediate representation that supports a wide range of front ends and a wide range of back ends. But for really high performance, it doesn't work. And, and a big reason it doesn't work is because these vector instructions are evolving and changing and becoming much, much more complex. And that's a problem. Uh, we don't want compilers to have to do this. But interestingly, and so this example just shows that um, Halide gets 2.6x better performance than LLVM on uh, one particular code. Um, and I'll skip the, the, the gory details of why, but the second feature, which was interesting to us is that even Halide with its custom code generator doesn't get the best performance. And in fact, we show that with our approach, we can do even better. And the reason is because Halide, just like LLVM, is still using manual pattern matching to generate code for each of these targets. And every target here is enormously complex. It is literally hundreds of thousands of instructions and a lot of cross lane complex vector instructions, non simd vector instructions, which are very hard to opt to select and tune. And so Halide actually leaves significant performance on the table. And so what we've shown, for example, is that in a fully connected convolutional layer uh, for neural networks, um, Halide is almost 5x worse than Hydride, the R compiler. And the reason is because it's generating long sequences of SIMD multiplier and shuffle instructions, where Hydride is able to find a much more efficient sequence of pretty complex dot product and a, a complex shuffle instruction at the end, which give you much better performance, but Halide just didn't find that instruction sequence. And so the problem is manual pattern matching, even for customized for each architecture isn't really good enough. And so to make a long story short, I'm gonna jump through a lot here, but to make a long story short, um, the way what Hydride does is that we, enable a front end to use an automated approach to go from front end to back end code generation through two parts. So let me just step back to the two parts here. The first part is that we use a specification of the hardware ISA. So for example, Intel, Qualcomm, ARM have all provided precise semantics of their instruction sets, um, at least the vector instruction sets. Um, in different forms. So Intel and Qualcomm use a pseudocode form and they use different pseudocode and it's not a precise formal language, but it's detailed enough that you can extract it into a formal semantics. And ARM actually has a formal semantic language for this. And so we use that to construct a formal semantics for the, extra, for the target ISA. And then most importantly, we automatically generate both uh, the target uh, specific intrinsics for the particular ISA, but we also generate a target independent IR set, set of IR operations at the LLVM level and the pattern and an instruction selector, which is really a very limited pattern matching translator from the target agnostic to the target specific intrinsics. And we do that fully automatically from the ISA semantics. And uh, that comes with a full formal semantics of the, uh, of the LLVM IR. And now the front end can use program synthesis instead of pattern matching in order to generate code uh, for this target backend. And this gives two advantages. You get 100% coverage of the backend because the original uh, ISA is fully covered by the automated uh, IR generator. And second, um, by using synthesis and pattern matching, you can find efficient code sequences, at least up to the search depth of the, of the uh, synthesis tool. And so um, that's broadly what Hydride does. I will have to skip the technical detail. And by the way, oh, sorry, one important detail is that you can automatically do this for multiple hardware ISAs. And we do that right now for both x86 and for hexagon HVX which are very different vector ISAs with very different vector lengths um, and very different complex vector instruction sets, but they've been abstracted away into a common set of uh, hardware agnostic LLVM IR instructions. 
And the most importantly, the front end doesn't have to be modified in order to target multiple target ISAs. Um, and so there are many benefits of, uh, of this approach. You get the patterns don't need to be hard coded. The code gen for new instructions can be added fully automatically. You get maximum instruction coverage for large ISAs. You get retargetability for a new ISA for essentially free, but you just have to write a parser for the hardware ISA specification. And you, have, you can have formal correctness guarantees because you have a full form and semantics for every step of the process. And so I'm gonna skip the deeper dive into the two main parts, the automatic IR generator and the synthesis based front end. And in fact, I think uh, maybe what I will do is just let me go forward to show. So there's lots of details in how we do the similarity checking to create the ISAs and all the different features, but just very quickly to show you what results we can get. So for x86, there are over 2000 machine instructions and we are able to reduce that to about 136 auto LLVM IR. So we call the IR automatically generated by Hydride the auto LLVM IR. So we reduce 2076 to 136. For hexagon 307, if you just do hexagon, you get 109. If you do them both together, you get 235. And so we only save 10 common instructions here. But the overall reduction is very high um, in terms of the, uh, the auto LLVM IR. Um, so I'll skip some of the details here, but that shows you that we're able to do the, to distill out an ISA into a common, into a small set of hard, hardware independent instructions. And so in our evaluation, what the main question we wanted to ask is, can we compete with hand-tuned Halite performance, which is a highly engineered compiler system, production compiler for, for people who really, really care about the last drop of performance. And then the for both uh, architectures. And then the second question is how long does the synthesis take, which is the biggest challenge in this area. And so in for the H, so I'll just breeze through the results a little bit here. But what we found is that comparing with the baseline production halide compiler on hexagon, we get a geometric mean speed up of 35% across these benchmarks. And the reason we get that is because we're able to make use of much more complex uh, shuffle and dot product instructions like the example I showed at the very beginning, uh, which was the fully connected layer, kind of the best case example on this slide. There are two cases where we get slightly worse performance because we create higher register pressure in the final code generated by the backend. Um, and then on x86, we get slightly lower, but we get only 6% rather than 35% because x86 has fewer of those very complex uh, shuffle and dot product instructions, but it does have a few. And that's where the geometric mean gain comes from. But notice here that we did not lose performance at all, which itself is an accomplishment because halide is so heavily tuned for both x86 and hexagon. The bad news is on the synthesis time. So the synthesis takes a long time. And especially for cases where there are complex shuffle and non simd dot product type instructions, it can take many hours to generate code for individual kernels. And this is something that we are really trying to improve now. So there are a number of ways you can do this. One is we extensively prune the target grammar, which is the only way we're able to do the synthesis. We use a scaling technique on the vector sizes, which is also essential for practical synthesis on HVX. We've also added more recently a memoizing uh, strategy, which is not captured on the previous synthesis times. But in most cases, we can greatly reduce the synthesis time by memoizing because the same expressions come up over and over again in many kernels. And in future work, we're looking at whether we can move this, completely eliminate synthesis entirely from the compilation time to entirely a compiler uh, creation time. And also, can we make it much more uh, scalable than what it is today? So I'm going to skip the summary and ongoing work for Hydride and stop there. Um, I've talked about three parts of the work, the baseline HPVM work, the HPVM to FPGA work in particular, and Hydride for automatic retargeting. I'll be happy to stop there and take any questions you may have. I'm sorry for running over a few minutes here. Thank you. Thank you, Vikram, for a great presentation. Sure. Taking the occasion, I'd like to invite you all 
the next Degust is going to happen in two weeks on the 11th of May. We will have Kevin Kostatin from Disney, who will be talking about challenges of scaling and optimizing infrastructure for animation workloads. And now we are happy to move on to the uh, Q&A session. So you can feel free to put um, your questions in the chat or raise your hand and I will unmute you. So <clears throat> you talked a lot about, maybe I'll, I'll have a question about the things you did. What is sort of the, the goal that you're looking for in say a year or two with those frameworks? Um, the ideal case scenario, let's call it. So we have a number of uh, goals in terms of ongoing directions. One of them is that we are extending Hydride to greatly improve synthesis times. And we're also using Hydride now in this work on new accelerators, both in, uh, so we're using it in MLIR to target new accelerators. We're using it to create new dialects in MLIR. We're using uh, Hydride to uh, compile to deep in memory and in storage custom accelerators as well. So that's uh, all in the Hydride side of the work. Um, in another direction, we are extending HPVM for distributed parallel applications because the data flow model, uh, if you ignore for a moment the shared memory capability, the logical data movement between nodes is a good abstraction for data movement across, like for example, nodes connected over the internet, systems connected over the internet, a true distributed system. And many edge applications are fundamentally distributed across multiple edge devices and the cloud. And so we are now extending HPVM with a distributed runtime system and uh, compiler features to be able to compile to distributed systems. And as part of that, we are also extending some of our approximate computing work. So, so far our approximate computing work has focused on, on accuracy trade-offs for uh, neural networks. And we've gotten we've gotten dramatic performance improvements like 2x to 10x performance improvements and energy efficiency, with very small drop in accuracy for an, for a machine learning model. And uh, we've also shown that we can get much better results by taking application quality metrics into account. And now we're extending that to so we did that for a robotics application, and we're now extending that work to other domains like. Uh, AR, VR, so distributed immersive applications which use AR, VR at the edges, but uh, have many people interacting over um, for a distributed immersive application has very stringent bandwidth and latency goals. And so the distributed HPVM work is going to be one key component of that. And also Thank the approximations you. to optimize performance and energy. Thank you. So a quick follow-up question to that. You mentioned these distributed applications on the edge, right? Yeah. Um, have you maybe thought about applying this to chiplet designs? Right. You don't have an internet, you have a smaller network then, but um, could those same methods be moved to, to that as well? You said chiplet, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 yeah. yes, yes. So not specifically chiplets, but we have, in fact, uh, Adil, Adil Ajay, who did the HP to FPGA work, collaborated with David Brooks and his and Guyan Wei at Harvard to do an automatic chip design project, where we basically used HPVM to uh, generate a program, the parallel program representation, which is the HPVM IR, use that to drive a hardware design space tool, exploration tool that was developed at Harvard, and we created this iterative design flow to automatically design accelerators for parts of an high level application code that so it's a parallel code in c++ ported to hpvm and so that uh, even that did not have chiplets but it had a single chip with multiple accelerators and i think the main extension you would need for chiplets is to have a, a different communication uh, cost metric which is already there in our model, but the cost would be different for a chiplet architecture. But partitioning and taking into account different communication costs 
is not uh, is, is already being done in that work. And that work is called Trireme. It appeared in Micro just earlier this year. And I'll be happy to send you that paper if you're interested. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. It seems that we don't have any other questions. So yeah. thank you for your time and see you all in two weeks. My pleasure and thank you everyone for, for staying a little late.